Okay, yeah, I just wanted to make sure to record also because we're going to be uploading this session onto YouTube later, right okay. after the meeting is over. Okay, um, great. Yeah, and also if time permits at the end, we're going to go over the questions that people have, maybe around like the last five to 10 minute mark. Um, but, you know, I'm not the only interviewer today. So if Yuna, you would like to interview, I mean, not interview, um, introduce yourself. Hi everyone, thank you so much for attending. Um and you and the other interviewer for today. Um look at be on the lookout for more legal events and social work and have I hope you guys will have a lot from this meeting. Thanks. Okay, well perfect. Um, and so I guess we're gonna start with some of the questions and I think it would be perfect for you, Taylor, to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about you and, you know, your experience being in a, you know, woman in the legal field. We're super excited to learn about it. So, yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Taylor McLaughlin, um, and I'm really excited to be here talking to all of you. Um, yeah, my background is, is you know, pretty simple. Um, I went to undergrad um, at High Point University. Uh, I played basketball there. Uh, I graduated early and my degree is in business. I, I did not know at the time that I wanted to go to law school. So that's something that's a little bit different than um, other people. But after I graduated, uh, I went home. I'm originally from Jersey um, and my family was living in New York at the time. So I went back to New York, um, tried to figure out my life a little bit, figure out what I wanted to do. Um, and in that time is when I decided to go to law school. Um, and then I just graduated from Ohio State Law School. Um, and now I'm working full time. So um, that's a little bit of my background and how I got to where I am now. That's perfect. And I think like, you know, it reassures a lot of people who are, you know, worried about, oh, should I go into law directly after college? Or is there like time? So even I, I'm like considering taking a gap year. So I think it's perfect, you know, that's to see other people that have done that. Oh yeah, no, for sure. I think that is a question that some people, you know, want to know, like if what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. Um, you have to do what's right for you. Again, I didn't even know I wanted to be in law school. So I kind of had to take a gap year, if that makes sense, because I, I just, I graduated and I was done. Um, but I, there are benefits to, to taking a gap year. And again, everyone's different. So for me, um, my benefit was that I could start working and I could, you know, have jobs uh, because I played basketball in undergrad. I never really worked or had internships or anything like that. Um, so it was a good opportunity for me to get some experience, make some money. You know, we don't really have a lot of money in, in undergrad. So it was nice to get that a little bit of that under my belt. Um, and just have experience putting things on my resume, um, things like that. You can do that in your in your gap year. You can travel. You can spend time with your family. Um, you might have more time to study for the LSAT. Whatever it is, um, it's okay. Some people, um, you know, they decide if they, once they're done with school, if they stop, they, there's no going back. So if that's you and you feel like you need to go all the way through, then go ahead. Um, but I do think there are a lot of benefits to taking a gap year and just taking a, a break from school for a second, um, if, if that's what you choose. Yeah, and that completely makes a lot of sense too. And, you know, just like a reminder for everybody, like there's time, don't worry about it all. It's like, there's time to, you know, pursue things at your own pace. Yeah, and so, absolutely. Oh yeah, sorry about that. Um, no. um, another question would be like, currently you're a lag grad, right? So yeah. when you were a law student, knowing you were entering an industry that predominantly ran, how do you stay confident? Because I saw that a lot that you mentioned during your um, TikToks. And I was like, mm -hmm. okay, well, I want to know how I should like, you know, what should I focus on to achieve that mission? And how do you like continue to do so, you know? Yeah. So I think the first thing is, you know, it starts with, it starts with my personality, right? So like I have I think always kind of been in a place where I was doing things in male dominated fields. My degree is in business. Most of the classes were all men in my classes. I played basketball. Like that's a, a, a boys, you know, sport, like, you know, so things like that, where I was always in the room 
where it, it was male dominated. And, and that also, you know, happens when you're in the legal field and not only just the legal field, but in, in what I do now is working at a firm, working in the corporate group at a firm that is also male dominated. So I think for me was uh, my personality fits. I have a strong personality. So I think that definitely helps me specifically. Um, but even if you don't, I think that you have to, you have to build your own confidence first, right? No one is going to, to hand out confidence. So, and doing that and how you do it is you, you put yourself in places where you're uncomfortable. Being in uncomfortable spaces forces you to grow some sort of confidence. It, it's, it forces you to grow as a person. Um, so I think that's the first step is just putting yourself in places where you might be uncomfortable and, and it forces you to grow. And then on top of that, um, you challenge yourself, you put, you give yourself new opportunities, you speak up, you know, I, I think there, there's a tendency to be quiet or not stand on your opinions, um, in spaces that <clears throat> might be male dominated. So I think you know, for you, um, who might, anyone who might be concerned about something like that, you should absolutely, you know, use your voice as much as you can, um, and, and show up. And I think that will help you navigate, um, your, your time in the, in the legal field and beyond. Yeah. Cause I actually remember a story once like before I when I was a member of League Out when Christina Stratton came and she gave yeah. an interview too and she told us like oh you know there was a time when she would do like her essays and she would like highlight it in pink and then she thought wait like you know after she turned it in she was like oh like the teacher might not like that and it's like well why wouldn't he like it when there's like a sign that like a girl did it you know so I think yeah like, just confidence having confidence in yourself is like super important and mainly you know, like in law school you know you're doing it so that's awesome like you're already out and you know yeah. law grad over here yeah no I think you just you just have to do it and I think I, I do things like that purposefully like I'll purposely wear pink suits I'll purposefully like walk around like I have this like pink Stanley I bring it everywhere like my phone my phone is pink my all of my things are pink so I bring it up and I bring these things everywhere with me um so, you know, I think you have to be, you have to just have your own confidence in those things and just do it, you know, um, and people might make comments and that's fine, but that's not going to change you or who you are or what you do um, every day. They can't, it, it doesn't change how smart you are and what you're capable of. So you just keep doing it and eventually they'll stop making comments. They'll stop saying things and they'll just understand that that's who you are and you continue to be who you are you know yeah no definitely but well I'm glad to you know have those words to oh another person came into the chat but yeah I'm glad to you know have to have that in the back of the mind of like you know confidence is mainly what it is all about and yeah. so in regards to that what would be some advice you would give in terms you know if you were in a position like prior to law law school like what would be some internships that you would tell people oh you should like take this opportunity or what careers you should you should be like not careers but um jobs look into like what jobs you should be like looking into after um your undergraduate career you know yeah I think so for me um I I never had a job in the legal field or anything law related. Um, and some people before law school, they do, they work in, in politics or they work at a law firm um, and their degree is in uh, political science. And that's great. You know, if, th if that's you, that's amazing. And I think those are great things to do, um, but it doesn't have to be you. And it, it, and it wasn't me, you know, like I said, my degree was in business. Um, I never took anything law related. I never did anything law related and that was okay. It didn't deter me from getting into law school by any means. Um, so, but if you're in a position to, to do those things, I think that's great. I think you should try to get internships, um, whether that be with a law firm or um, maybe something with the a court or 
a political campaign or something, um, if, if that interests you, I think those are good things, good experience to just have a little, you know, like dip your toe into the legal field a little bit. Um, you know, if that interests you, do it. Um, or it could be, it could really be anything. You could have any job, honestly. Um, my first job out of school was being an assistant wedding coordinator. That was my first job. My next job was working at the front desk at a, at a gym. Um, so it doesn't have to be those things, but if you think you want to do things that are, are building your resume and help helping to set you up for success, then I would look for jobs and inter internships in the legal field, whether that be, um, you know, word of mouth, you talk to people, you ask around, um, you look online for po job postings, um, you talk to maybe some of your friends that might be in law school, if you have any, those things I think will help you, um, navigate ways to, to find those jobs. Um, but I think just working in itself is, is just good. That looks good on a resume, just having a job. Yeah. And also I'm guessing like volunteer experience too, like volunteering oh, yeah. a lot. Oh yeah, absolutely. I would, I would volunteer. I volunteer at like, I generally building your resume is a good idea. So whether that's volunteering, being a part of an organization, um, writing something, getting something published, like anything that sounds like you can put on your resume is always a good idea and and do something that you enjoy too um but yes absolutely volunteering um and that's probably an easier thing to do than getting a job if you can volunteer somewhere um a hundred percent yeah okay well perfect and now we're gonna start like you know going into the law application process or like yeah the law school application process with yuna so if you could take it away yuna first um so like carolina said that these questions are going to be a bit more like focused on like law school and its application. Um, do you have any advice for like networking with professors and like securing recommendation letters? Because I know that kind of like nerves people out um, like during your undergraduate career. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, the first thing is to do well, do well in those classes, right? If you wanna, if you want a professor to give you a recommendation letter, you should probably do well in that class. That's number one. Um, but I think it's important to maintain a relationship with with professors, especially ones that you enjoy. Um, I know for me, um, I was almost kind of forced into it because I played basketball. And so we travel a lot. So I had to introduce myself to the professor on the first day. I had to give the professor my schedule because I would be leaving and I wouldn't be in class, you know, a handful of times throughout the semester. I had to arrange new days to take tests sometimes because I was traveling um, or go to an office hour because I missed stuff and I needed to learn it. Um, so I was kind of forced into it, but you should do those things anyway. You know, I always think it's a good idea to introduce yourself to your professor, to sit towards the front of your classes, to ask questions. Um, I didn't really um, on my own go to office hours until I was in law school. Um, but that, I think that's something you should do an undergrad, um, because that gives you more one-on-one -on -one time with the professor and they get to know you for you. It looks like you care about the subject and what you're learning and you'll probably end up doing better in the class because of it. Um, so I think that's a win-win. And I think having that relationship is what allows you to then get those recommendation letters down the line. I know I've had like one recommendation letter from a professor before who I was really close with. Um, but again, because I also took a gap year, I had really good relationships with my employer. Um, I think that's important to be um, having good relationships with your manager, your CEO, president, whoever is in charge of you. You should have a, some sort of good relationship with them um, because those are good people to have uh, letters from. And when you're applying, you know, if you're further out from school, they'll, they'll want recommendation letters from your employer as opposed to professors. Um, so I think that's just a better situation to be in, but it's all about the relationship and just maintaining communication. Of course. Um, the next question is more like based on the LSAT. Um, do you have any recommendations for studying? Because I know that's like a huge concern for like law students, like pre-law students, and like which website or service you used or like how you studied. Yeah, um, so I will say when I first started studying, I used actual like books. 
Um, but the first test I took was the first test that was completely electronic. Um, and so now it's all electronic. So that's, you don't really need like books anymore if you don't need them. Um, I would per I would recommend doing programs that are online because I, you get used to taking the test online. Um, so I would say I have two, I think the LSAT Demon is really good. Um, they have a online program that you uh, would have to pay for, but I think it's a really good program. It was really helpful. Um, and they also have a podcast. Uh, I think their podcast is really good, highly recommend. Um, and then Blueprint LSAT. Blueprint LSAT, I used their, the actual books when I first started studying. Um, and now they have a whole electronic system. They have a lot of free resources. I highly recommend finding the free resources first and foremost. Um, sometimes, I don't know, like it really just depends on your on how you study and how things are going for you because I hate that people like have to pay for LSAT resources. Like I just think that really sucks. Um, and you don't have to spend a million dollars on a personal tutor and all that stuff. Like you do not have to do that. Um, but you might have to, you know, deal out a couple dollars for a program um, just so that you're really getting all the resources that you can use. Um, so I would say LSAT Demon, again, you do have to pay for that. Blueprint LSAT has so many free resources. So I would absolutely take advantage of those. And then they might have a couple programs that you have to pay for, I think. Um, and there might be a sprinkle of other ones, but I do know those two, I think were the most beneficial um, in my time studying for them. How um, in advance did you like start preparing and studying? Yeah, so I started studying, I decided in July uh, that I wanted to take the LSAT. So I started studying in July and then I took the LSAT in September. So that was about three months. Um, and then I didn't like my score. So I took the LSAT again in January. So that was from, we got our scores in like October. So then October, December, Jan January. No, October, November, December, January. So like three months each, like three months in between. So, and I would recommend three, more than three, three to six months-ish studying for each LSAT. Obviously, once you take the first one, I would, I would build in the most time before the first one. And then, you know, they offered again, like November and then January. November was too quick of a turnaround for me when I got my results in October. Um, so I think January was better at that point. Um, so I think three months and up is how long you should study. Thank you. Cause I've been, honestly, I've been wondering like when I should start to. Um, yeah. The next question is attending law school. Would you like everything that you imagined that it would be like, what do you think of the school environment or like professors and resources workload wise? Yeah, it's, I don't know. I think it was different than I imagined. Um, I didn't even know if I could get into law school when I applied. Um, I was really nervous about that. I just thought that like, I just had severe imposter syndrome. And I really just thought that I like couldn't get into law school. I don't know, but I did. Um, and I got into a lot of law school, so I was capable. Um, but I think I just imagined it to be I don't know like I had a life like I had a life in law school and I think people scare you and they try to tell you that you won't have a life and that you will study all the time and how hard it is and it is hard um and it is hard in a lot of different ways but I also had a great time um I had a lot of fun I made a lot of friends I did a lot of things I traveled a lot I went out a lot I studied a lot like I had a well-rounded life, I think. Um, and I think before law school, I didn't think I would have any kind of life. I thought I was gonna be really sheltered and never do anything fun and just kind of have my head down for three years. And that wasn't the case. Um, so I think that's one thing that you don't be scared of if that's something you might be scared of. Um, it is possible to have a life and be successful and do well. Um, and I also think you mentioned uh, the resources and the teachers and things. I think 
Um, it depends on where you go to school because some schools have professors that really suck. <laughs> some schools ha don't have a lot of resources um, or they don't try to. Um, so I think it just depends I, for me. And that's like a very law school thing to say <laughs> is it depends. That's like a, a thing, but it does depend. Um, for me, I went to Ohio State and I love Ohio State so much. Um, I think Ohio State gives you the best balance of everything. So I think starting with, you know, it's, it's a high rank school. It's the 22nd, you know, best law school in the country. I think that's great. And, you know, we don't have to be number one, two or three um, to be a really good school and to go to really good programs. Like, you know, 22 is great. Right. So, we, and they've been climbing the rankings. So that's one, because a lot of people like worry about the rankings. It's a high rank school. We have great programs. Um, and the actual atmosphere is camaraderie based. It's very welcoming. Um, there's going to be competition wherever you go, just because that is the dynamic of law school, where it's a little competitive. Everybody tries hard, works hard, wants to be the best. We all can't be the best because that's just not how things work. Um, so that is, you know, inherently going to happen. But you know, you want to go somewhere where you get the best of both worlds. Where can I go where it's going to be competitive, but it's also going to be people want to help me and not tear me down. And I think, you know, you don't get that at a school that's as high ranked as Ohio State. Like that's, that's a hard thing to come by at a high ranked school. Um, so I think that combination of things is really good. And because of that, we have really good resources. Ohio State in itself is a huge school. So we have a lot of good resources for that reason. Um, and we have a, we have a huge alumni base that is a resource in itself. Um, so I think, you know, it, it depends on where you go to school. Um, and I think coming to Ohio state, I had so many resources that I, I never thought that I, I might have ever. So that's my take on that. I really like what you said about like being like well-rounded because I feel like a lot of media paints law school to be like just studying day and night um yeah for the next question um did you know what field of law you wanted to practice before attending law school or did you like decide it during yeah yes and no so I came into law school um wanting to be a corporate lawyer which is what I do now um and also do sports and entertainment work um, which I also do, but I think at the time I didn't know what a corporate lawyer did. I had no idea, actually. It just sounded really good and my degree is in business. So I was like, okay, I want to be a corporate lawyer. Like, I feel like that makes sense, but I didn't know what a corporate lawyer did. Um, and then I actually came to law school. I learned about the transactional practice versus litigation, the private sector versus the public sector what you do in those areas. Um, and that allowed me to actually narrow down what I liked. I didn't limit myself. You know, I tried things. When I worked at a firm over the summer, I tried all the practice groups. Like I did, I got projects from all kinds of practice groups. Um, and that in itself helped me decide that, okay, I actually do want to do corporate law. I actually do like it. I do like what it's about. And I don't like these other um, practice areas. So for me, again, yes and no. Like I, I didn't know what it was, but it confirmed that I did. So now, you know, I'm doing what exactly what I wanted to do. Um, and that doesn't mean you have to know. Like, I want everyone to know that. Like, you don't have to know exactly what you want to do to go to law school. You could come to law school and do the complete opposite. I know people that came in, like, wanting to be, like, prosecutors, criminal defense attorneys, and now they, like, do, like, corporate law like at a firm it's completely different like they're totally different things um and that's okay that's, a, that's absolutely okay to to switch what you want to do um and that's what law school is for you have to you don't know until you do it and you won't get involved in it unless you come to law school and try it out so I think someone also put a question in the chat I don't know if you want me to answer these questions now or wait till the end Oh, we were thinking to wait until the end to answer them. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, so for the next question, um, 
what is one thing you wish you knew as like an undergrad that would have helped you in law school? Um, I think, I think for me, if I was not an athlete, um, I would have wanted, I would have gotten involved more. I would have joined more clubs. I would have had a job. I would have done internships. Um, I would have networked more. I didn't really have that in my position, but if I was a student who was able to do those things, that's what I would have done. Um, because, you know, I didn't know how important those things were before coming to law school. And, and I say that it did not, those things didn't deter me from getting what I wanted in law school and afterwards, but I think those would have been really important, especially if I was not an athlete, because being an athlete in itself, that held some weight that was like interesting to people. Um, and that also shaped me as a person. So I had that kind of to my advantage, um, but then having no other, you know, work or internships on my resume was on the other side. So I think that is something I would have just been more involved in. Um, I also actually think this is important. Um, LinkedIn is like your best friend. People in the legal profession love LinkedIn. Like that is like, that's the Instagram of the professional world. Okay. Um, and I only had an, I only had a LinkedIn in undergrad because it was required because I, I was a business major. So for one of the things that we did, it, we were required to create a LinkedIn and have a headshot. And like my school offered professional headshots. Um, so if your school does that, absolutely do it. I didn't because I didn't have time for that. Um, so I like my, <laughs> this is so funny. My picture on my LinkedIn for the longest time was like my media day headshot from basketball. Like the picture that they put on the roster. <laughs> that was my headshot on my LinkedIn for a really long time. Um, and then I like became a professional and like took real pictures, but that's all I had. That was the only professional headshot I ever took was like my roster picture. So, um, I, my advice would to, would be create a LinkedIn. If you don't already have one, start adding people, start adding your classmates. Cause those will be your colleagues in the future. Um, get a professional headshot taken, build your resume, put stuff on there and just start adding people. Just start connecting with people. You guys can connect with me. Just search, search me on LinkedIn. It's my name and we can connect on LinkedIn. Um, it's a great start. And I think it's really important. Um, everybody in this profession and adjacent professions are on LinkedIn. It's really important. Um, so if I was an undergrad, that's something I would have put more effort into when I was, was there and not wait until law school to do that. So that's one thing. I love that you called it the Instagram of the professional world. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I will be sending you a connection or a link. Yeah, please um, do. <laughs> anyway, um, what has been your favorite law school course thus far and why? My favorite law school course. Honestly, this is so contradictory, I think, to what I do now. Actually, I have two. But I think my first favorite was my trial practice class which trial practice is literally all about litigation. And I don't do litigation. I don't do anything in a courtroom. I don't write any motions. I don't go before a judge. I don't do any of those things. Um, but I loved that class. And I don't know if it was the class itself or how it was taught. So at Ohio State, this class is called trial practice and it's taught by one of the federal judges and he teaches it in his courtroom. Um, so I would go to the federal courtroom twice a week and he would teach this class. And basically we would get a prompt um, and you would either be doing a direct examination or a cross examination or introducing a, an exhibit um, and based on a hypothetical. And that's what you do the whole class. So you literally go before the judge and like you direct exam or cross exam a witness for the whole class like everybody just goes and you go and each person goes and you this is actually kind of it's also kind of scary but it's fine you do your you know cross-examination for example and then in front of everyone the judge gives you feedback 
and he basically tells you it was good or you suck and it builds character it's really important especially if you want to be a litigator like you need to be able to speak in front of people and take criticism and be on the spot and even though I don't want to litigate I think it was really important for me to be vocal and just put myself out there and do something different. And it was an opportunity for me to create a really good relationship with a federal judge. Who doesn't want that? Like, that's great. That's a, an amazing thing to do. Um, it also worked out that this particular federal judge for like, I don't know, like 20 years was a partner at the firm that I now work at. Um, so it's all about the networking. That's, and I will talk about that at some point, I don't know when, but I just want everyone to know that networking is like the key to everything. And that in itself was just like really important for me to be in his class, for him to know who I am, for me to learn from him, get feedback from him um, and just, you know, have that opportunity. My second class that I think is also equally as important in a different way was a class called client development. And I mentioned these classes, too, because these are not your traditional 1L classes. 1Ls, first year law students, they take contracts they take torts they take property they take civil procedure i hated all those classes <laughs> you have to take them that's those are the, those are the subjects that are on the bar exam every 1l takes those classes um i didn't like really i didn't really like any of them the classes that i liked the most were the classes you got to choose after your first year of law school that were tailored to the things that you like um, and that were more experiential as opposed to reading a case book all day and taking a final exam. Um, in trial practice, our final exam was a full-blown trial. Like that's fun. That's like a fun thing to do. Um, so that, so I preface all of this by saying that, but my other class was a class called client development that was taught by an adjunct professor who is a uh, partner at a law firm. She also own, owns a venture capital business and she teaches this class. And it was basically about being a lawyer in the real world, how to create a book of business, how to get clients, how your salary is paid at a law firm, how a law firm makes money, like how partners make money. What do partners do? Those things that like people don't tell you that are actually real and tangible, like practical things is what that class was about. Um, and I thought that was amazing. I love that OSU even has that class. I think other schools need to have those things. I don't know if they do, um, but those classes, any class that's experiential, I think is like the best class to take. Wait, I do have a quick question. Were you yeah. ever cold called? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. You're, that's like, in, like inevitable. You will be cold called. Everyone is cold called. <laughs> that's a real thing um it's not okay but it's not as scary as like I don't know how the tv shows make it seem or whatever um that is that is real you will be cold called by every professor you will like that's real um it's more stressful than you th like think it actually is people don't care people are more concerned about themselves and like not getting called on. Um, and after your first year, you just care less. The professors care less. They usually don't cold call as much. Sometimes they do. Some professors just like to do it just to do it. Some professors kind of tell you when you're going to be called on. They'll like do it in alphabetical order or they do panels and they'll be like, okay, this panel will get called on on Tuesdays. So like you could get called on, on, on Tuesday. So like that kind of helps you out a little bit. And so you like read extra close that night before that class, but it's really not as bad. I mean, I black out during most of the cold calls. I couldn't really name like one of them. Um, and it is stressful, but honestly, like it's really okay. And, and every professor is different. Some professor like will give you the answer after you after you've said a couple things. Some professors, We'll keep asking you questions until you get it wrong. And that's just how they do things. Um, but it's it's not as bad as it looks. And it, it'll be over before you know it. So, but that is, if the question is if it's real and if it happens, it, it is real and it happens to everyone. So, yes. Okay, yeah. Because I saw like some TikToks of people and you including. And so it's like, you know, just like the stress of it and all. But glad, yeah. like it's stressful. But glad like everybody's on like the same 
you know train I guess yeah (laughs) Yeah, everybody goes through it you're not alone like everyone has that experience so like it's okay I promise you and nobody really cares like it's okay (laughs) okay but one of the I guess the last question would be what advice would you share with our undergraduate body who aspires to attend law school and become the next generation of female lawyers yeah well this is where my networking bit comes in because that is my biggest piece of advice always I will stand on this till the day I die okay this is so important networking is like and I didn't even know I didn't even know the extent of that until I got to law school and on its face networking sounds so scary right it sounds like you're being forced to be social you're being forced to like talk to people or like people and maybe you don't like that I have really bad anxiety so I really don't like to like talk to people I don't know I really don't even like to talk to people (laughs) I don't want to do that but sometimes you have to um and this is a part of getting uncomfortable right and so my the beginning of my first year of law school I had to force myself to to be uncomfortable and talk to people I had never talked to before and you know and just get to know people. Um, and that in itself can, can change the trajectory of your law school experience, your career. Um, I think at the end of the day, your grades are going to be good. Like you're okay. I think if you're in law school, something about you likes academic validation, you like, you're smart, you will be smart and that's okay. Like grades will be fine. Um, but not everybody is personable. Not everybody is likable. Not everybody can hold a conversation with someone um, or speak in front of people. Um, and that is pivotal, right? So you have to be able to meet people and have them like you, be able to advocate for you, want to mentor you. Um, and that will change everything. And I say that because my experience was amazing. Um, I forced myself to network the second I stepped foot on campus. And if I could have done it earlier, I would have. Um, But by networking, and when I say networking, that meant telling somebody, your career advisor, whoever, what you wanna do and who you should talk to. That person will put you in connection with somebody. For me, it was a lawyer in town, who was a black woman who went to my law school is now working at the firm that I work at. Um, and she was the first person I met and we just got connected. We talked, I asked her questions. I asked her about law school. I asked her about herself, her personal life, little things just to get to know her. I had no agenda. I had no thoughts. I just didn't know any, I didn't know any lawyers and I didn't know any law firms and I didn't know what I wanted to do. It's like day one. Um, And so I did that and she connected me with someone else who connected me with someone else. And that just kind of trickled down for like a month and a half. Um, And again, no agenda, no, you know, thoughts about anything or formal process. And by November, they called me one day and offered me a job. And I was like, oh, okay, (laughs) sure. And it was a, you know, it was a great opportunity. And like, that was my first summer. I had a, you know, a summer associate position at a firm great firm, great experience. I love the people. Um, and then I was offered back to come my second summer. And then after my second summer, I was offered a full-time job and that's what I do now. Um, and that was all because of networking with people. Um, my first job was offered to me. It was not contingent on my grades. So no matter what my grades were, I was still going to be offered that job. Um, my grades were like, you know, fine. Like I had generally good grades. I don't have straight A's by any means, but my grades were good. Like I was just cruising through. Um, and you know, and I, and I still had a job and you know, my, my grades were what they were and I didn't have to be top of my class to work at a great firm, um, and do what I want to do and work with great people. So, you know, that is my story. And I think the more people do those things and, and kind of get out of their head of just like, you know, their grades and, and this doesn't mean grades aren't important, because most people will tell you that's like the first thing grades are important. That's all you need to do. Your one L is get good grades. And and that's not, not true. You, you should do well, but it's not the only thing. I think networking is just as important as that, if not more important, because at the end of the day, people hire you for who you are and what you can do. So, um, 
I think that's the most important thing um, at the end of the day. Just put yourself out there, talk to people, grab coffee, ask them about their lives and stay in contact. And that will do wonders for your for your career. Well, that's awesome. Okay, so we got LinkedIn, networking, and confidence overall, guys. That's, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really happy to hear and that things are going super great for you. Yeah. And, you know, I hope that everybody that's, you know, in the meeting, that it will go great in the future. But so now we're going to push it to everybody's individual questions. So if you guys could leave them in the chat and me and you and I are going to read them out just so everybody, if they have like any inquiries or anything they want to ask you. Uh, those questions can be addressed. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's that we had. Oh, hi, Risha. <laughs> um, let's see. We are going to start with Emily's. And she thinks, do you think your business degree from undergrad would also help you become a corporate corporate lawyer? I am also a business economics degree, so I was just wondering. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, my business degree absolutely will help me. Um, I think it's helped me just in general understanding business and how it works. Um, I also, so like I said, my degree was in business. And then while I was in law school, um, I was on the business law journal. Um, and so now I, I, I do corporate law. Um, and it absolutely helps to have some sort of background. It's not end all be all. So like, you know, if somebody wants to be a corporate lawyer and they don't have a degree in business, that is also okay. Like you'll learn. Um, but I definitely think it's helpful. And I think that if that's something you're interested in down the line, um, that degree will, will work in your, in your best interest also. Okay. Yeah. So I guess like undergraduate, you know, degrees also help a lot with that. Yeah. And let's see, I'll wait a little bit more to see if any other person would like to leave a question in the chat. Okay, um, it says, would you say your classroom is typically the same age as you or would you say it's diverse? Mm -hmm. That's a question. Um, yeah, no, it's definitely diverse. Um, it depends. So there's going to be a good chunk of people who went straight through. So they're probably going to be around the ages of 22, 23, um, because they just graduated and they went straight to law school. Um, but there's always a handful of, I want to say, I don't know what the exact numbers are, but it's definitely a range. So like I was like a year or two older than people when I started because of my gap year. Um, and then there are people who, you know, are like in their 40s, full blown kids, family, some people are in their 30s. Um, some people who were young for their grade or graduated early and they were like 20 when they got to law school, like it's really diverse. Um, you will have class with all kinds of people, all age groups, people who are married, people who have kids, people who don't have any of that, people who still live at home. Like it's, it's a variety of things. You'll all have people from all different backgrounds. Um, and which is one great thing about law school is like people are so different. Um, people's backgrounds are so different. So um, the age, I mean, the, the general age range is like, you know, when you first start is like 22, 23 to maybe like your later 20s. But in all of law school, you know, you could be any age. I have friends who are in their 30s. I have friends who are in their 20s. Um, I know a couple people who are like 40. Um, but it, it's a general, it, it's a general age range, if that makes sense. Okay, got it. And I guess since I'm not seeing any other question pop in the chat currently, I guess one that I have is like, I know you addressed it in your TikTok, but a little bit more information on the curve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, okay. So how do I explain this? I want to explain it the best way I can that you guys will understand. Um, so every school grades on a curve differently. So I'll, I'll, I'll say that first. Um, some schools don't have a curve or they, they do have a curve, but it's a little bit different because there are schools that are pass fail. Um, like I know Harvard, for example, is a, is a pass fail school. There are some other T14s that are pass fail schools. So like they don't give you letter grades. 
or number grades, you just pass or fail a class. I do think there's more to that. So I won't speak too much on that because I we don't have that system. Um, but generally, the way the curve works is there are a certain amount of people in your class. So say there's, you know, 10, let's say there's 10 people. There's usually more than that. But say there's 10 people in your class um, as a 1L. Now, as a 1L, you will always be in a section. That's the first thing. So if we're all 1Ls at Ohio State, at Ohio State, we have three sections. Some have two, depends on how many people you, like, you have at your school. And so for us, we have Scarlet, Gray, Buckeye. Those are our three sections. And in those sections, it's basically like your cohort. You go to every class with those people. So in your first semester, you guys will take torts, you'll take, I don't know, civil procedure, and you'll take criminal law. So in those three classes, your those main core classes you have, all 10 people in your class have all these same classes together. You have the same professors, you go at the same time, you take those classes together, right? Now, within your cohort, you will be graded on a curve in each class. And so the way that works is, I think it's like 60% of those people. So six people in your class have to get a B. They have to, that's how it works. So six people have to get anywhere from a B plus B, B minus in that range. And then three people have to get an A. So somebody has got to get an A, A plus, A minus. And then whatever is the rest of that, two, one, I don't know, have to get a C or below. And you have to, you know what I mean? Like everybody can't get an A because they did good work. So when you take your final exam, which your final exam is basically your grade in the class. Um, when you take your final exam, the professor grades you and has to give you a certain grade. So, you know, if me and Yuna both did really good, but Yuna, you know, wrote something a little bit extra or a little bit better on her essay, her final essay, she might get the A minus and I have to get the B plus because that's just how it works. So that's why we say the curve like kind of sucks because somebody has to get the lower grade. And that's why it's also competitive because you're competing against each other as opposed, so you're being graded against each other as opposed to just being graded on how well you did. So, you know, if, if, if we're going against each other and yours is better than mine, in some aspect, I have to get a lower grade because of it. Um, and so that's why it sucks <laughs> because, you know, you could have done really good work, but it just wasn't as good as Yuna's. And so Yuna's got an A and you got a B and that's just what it is. Um, and so that's how it works for every class. So you just kind of want to fall in a, in a good place where you're maybe on the higher end of that class. Um, but it, it, depends every time and the way it works after your first year of law school is um and again this might depend on the school but at least at Ohio State the curve is different it's it's lighter and so like in your second year of law school it's not as strict of a curve which means like everybody doesn't have to get a C like a lot of the second and third year classes you can get an A or a B or a professor doesn't give a C anymore you can only get A's and B's or they don't give lower than a 89 like that's more common too so your grades are better another thing is and again I don't know if this is other schools so I can only speak to Ohio State but your first year grades weigh less on your GPA than your second and third year grades so when you get better grades your second and third year because you will um those will boost your GPA because they weigh more um so that's just like another another thing but um generally that's how the curve works somebody has to get the c that's unfortunate you might have did really well but it's what it is um and you're graded against each other so okay well that makes sense but it's so competitive <laughs> yeah yeah oh well well thank you for clarifying that because i did have some questions like hmm how, how specifically does it work and yeah. I guess like the last one that I got um, direct message was um, how do you basically 
I in this one I remember from your TikTok because you I think you put it on your TikTok too. Where it's like, how do you balance like law and like a social life? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I do talk. I do talk about this a lot uh, because I think, it, like I said, like people don't really know that you can do that or whatever. Um, I think for me, how I balance it was like how I prioritize. I'm one very organized I'm a little like crazy and I have to like schedule every second of my day um that's just how I am or I'll like lose my mind so you know I just schedule things like I you know if I like for example tomorrow Ohio State has a big game but guys versus versus Penn State really important game right I love football I'm going to watch the games I'm going to go to the games So if I know I'm watching that game tomorrow at noon, but I have a paper due on Monday, how do I plan to get this paper done between now and Monday and also go to this game or watch this game, right? So like, I know that ahead of time. So I plan ahead of time. If I know that we have bar review, which bar review is just like the law school goes out to a bar every Thursday. If I know we have bar review on Thursday and I want to go out, but I have something to do on Friday morning. Well, I got a plan to get that done like by Tuesday night. That way I don't need to worry about it on Thursday. So I just like plan stuff. I just plan my life out in order to do the things I want to do. And there are times where I have to say no to things because I have to get stuff done. Um, But there's a lot of times where I can say yes also because I plan accordingly and I know how to prioritize, um, you know, what's important and what's not important. Um, And also for me, like I need to socialize I need to go out I need to do stuff or I will not be okay so you know I'm not the kind of person who can lock myself away in the library all weekend and like be sane I I I can't do that I can't study for 10 hours a day and be okay so if you're that kind of person where you're like I need to have a social life I need to make sure I work out every day and I need to make sure I go get coffee with my friends do that do those things, Um, you know, put in the hours when it's time to study and do the work, cut yourself off if if you're doing too much and take a break, breathe, call your mom, call your dad, call whoever, call whoever. Um, And like, it's okay. Like everything will continue on. But I think the biggest thing is just, you know, planning for that time, like planning ahead of time for the things that you want to do. Um, I think that's, that's just how you do it. That's how, that's how you balance it all. And some days are harder than others. Some days I'm like losing it and other days I feel really good. Um, and you just kind of have to like, let that be what it is. Yeah. And I, I totally agree with that. Although I haven't gone to law school, you know, I've learned a lot through your TikToks, definitely <laughs> through other people's TikToks. And I think it's like, you know, it's a great resource. It makes me feel like better about the whole process. So I just really wanted to thank you for like what you do too, you know? And, you know, I remember that you would post like, you know, journaling, it's also like really important to you. And I also journal. So I think that there's like these little things that you make space in your day that make like a great impact on you. Definitely. Yes, absolutely. Keep doing the things that you enjoy. Like that's one thing about law school. Like when you first start, it's so easy to kind of like lose yourself and um, feel this pressure of, of reading all the time or studying all the time. And losing what you do every day or feeling anxious and feeling like you can't, you know, stop and go work out or you can't take some time to like read your own, you know, nonfiction or fiction book that you like or whatever it is. Like people, it's really, really easy. And I, and at first I did have trouble with that. Like I did stop working out and I did stop doing the things that kind of like make me happy or feed my soul. Like I stopped doing those things and I had to, I had to correct that quickly because you will, you will lose yourself. And that's, it, it's, it's easy to do. Um, and it, it helps you stay grounded. Um, and just knowing that like, you can, you can balance it. Like you have to remind yourself that and you have to be really positive. Law school is a really negative space, unfortunately. Um, and, and partially rightfully so because part, it partially sucks, but part, parts of it don't suck. And I think you have to find your own positivity in that and making it feasible. Um, And you just, you know, you just keep doing the things that like make you happy, you know, and just finding those things throughout your, your experience. 
Well, thank you so much, Taylor, for your time and, you know, for like those words, because it means a lot, you know, just like, you know, paying attention to your person, you know, and then with all the advice that you gave, like networking and LinkedIn, I think yeah. a lot of people can learn from this. But yeah. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. I think that's going to be time. It's 6.02 p.m. But again, thank you so much, Taylor, for coming and being our guest speaker today. It means a lot to us. Yeah, that of course. Really <laughs> thank you, guys. Very so helpful, much. for sure. Thank you so much. Um, if any of you guys have any questions or anything, um, feel free to reach out to me. I'm actually going to put, um, I can put my email in the chat. Um, and then also you guys can share my email um, with anyone if they'd like, if anyone couldn't make it or had to hop off. Of course. Um, yeah, we can put it in the legal club chat. Okay. Yeah, it'll be perfect, actually. Um, yeah, so I have that. And yeah, or, you know, it's probably easier to email me, but you guys can reach out to me on social media too. But <laughs> email is probably a quicker way. Um, mm -hmm. Reach out. Um, I'm more than happy to talk with anybody, uh, answer any questions offline if you didn't get a chance or were uncomfortable talking here. Um, more than happy to. And uh, I really enjoyed talking to you guys this evening. So thank you for having me. We're so happy to have you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Of course, of course. You guys have a great evening. Um, and hopefully I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, same to you. Have a great evening. Okay, bye everyone. Bye.